Whether you're conquering professional exams or personal milestones, we welcome you to Beyond Clean's Confidence Certification, the 52-week test prep podcast series. With expert insights, actionable tips, and engaging discussions, we'll break down the toughest concepts in sterile processing and build your confidence every step of the way. Join host Sarah B. Cruz as she embarks on a mission to help you not just prep for tests, but craft your success story. And now your host, Sarah B. Cruz. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Confident Certification, a 52-week test prep podcast series to equip you to take your sterile processing career to the next level. I'm your host, Sarah B. Cruz, and on this episode, we have a very special guest. Now listen, I could give you the rundown of our guest's amazing resume and all she's contributed in her decades of sterile processing experience. But listen, we don't have a long enough show to go through why this woman is a phenomenal female. And I like to say that all that glitters isn't gold. It's just sharing green gold and showing up in the (laughs) sterile processing to advocate for our industry. She has decades of experience and originally joined us as a nurse and says she found her niche in sterile processing and these were her people. And uh, without further ado, Sharon, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, I know this is an audio podcast, but I am looking at Sharon Green Golden at work. She got her bouffant on. She got her blue scrubs. So talk about showing up for the industry at any time, drop of a notice. Thanks again for coming on, Sharon. Thank you. Yes. So, Sharon, I listen, I would never think to shortchange your experience with just that brief introduction. So why don't you give us a little intro about how long you've been in sterile processing and when you actually got your first certification? Okay. So to Clear a few things. I actually attended Albany State College in Albany, Georgia. I studied nursing. I always wanted to be a nurse. I started in the hospital back in 1972 as a high school CNA in a program called VICA, Vocational Industrial Clubs of America. And I went to the hospital and worked every day, every morning, and then in the afternoon, I went and did my classes. So when I finished high school, I already knew the trajectory I was on. I was going to be in the medical field. Went into nursing. Nursing was my passion then until I really, and this was a BSN program, until I realized that the people I was working with were not really in nursing for nursing. It was a job. They came, they took care of you. If they did good, good. If they didn't, they didn't. So at some point, I transferred. I became, before I got my nursing license, I became an L&D technician where I went to L&D and worked for five years delivering babies. Wonderful, wonderful job. But at some point, I got tired of people screaming and hollering to have the babies, and I moved on. I went from L&D to the operating room. In the operating room, I actually changed my trajectory and went into materials management and actually took care of materials for several years. Materials management at this particular hospital was connected to the the sterile processing department. So every day when I finished my work, I was nosy. I have a nosy spirit. I'd go over into SPD and ask them what they were doing, why they were doing it. At that time, they really couldn't give me an answer. It was a job. It was a job for them. We put the instruments together and we picked the case. We move on. And I wanted to learn what they were doing. So I said, would you show me the instruments? At that time, the people there were willing to share. And they showed me instruments. And I'd go, when I finished my work, I'd go over to cross the hall to SPD. And the only trays I could put up for about a year were plastic specialties. Nobody likes plastic specialties. It has too many hooks. It has too many scissors. They didn't like doing them. So here I came. It got to the point where they'd save them for me, like it was my job. Save those trays for sharing. As I started doing those trays, I had questions about why the instruments were in a tray a certain way. How do we clean them? 
So long story short, I learned how to clean instruments because this is an on-the-job training position. They taught me. I remember dragging the book with the recipe in it over into decon so I could put my tray together as I cleaned it because I felt if I put the tray together, then when it came out on the other side, it wasn't such a hassle. That was just me then. I've always had, so some people are born leaders and some people are taught leaders. I'm a born leader with a takeover spirit. So I went into that department and actually started taking over. This is how we should do this. This is how we should do that. I had nobody telling me. They didn't even have recipes that they could write on. We, I, we, we, they were on the computer. We were still using pencil and paper. I made a whole lot of changes. But what happened was I liked it. But no one in that department had the education, nor were they certified to help me climb a ladder that was invisible. So I started saving my money, my little money, and going to Isham fall meetings. At that time, Isham had meetings in the fall and in the spring. The spring was their major meeting. I went to the fall meeting and realized I wasn't seeing all the really important people. So I switched to the major meeting around 1989. But I started learning. I was not certified. I was considered a cell processing technician. They did not require we were certified. They just wanted us to do a job. So if you can understand it, they just wanted us to do a job. And they really didn't know if we were doing it right. They just knew that every day, which is sad, that back in the day, as long as they got a tray, they were happy. As long as there were no holes in the linen because we patched the linen, we sharpened needles, we did all kinds of things. I have cleaned gloves for reuse. We did some strange bad things back in the day. You know, we cooked out turkey dinner in the autoclave. Um, we just did things that just were wrong for patient care. But as I started learning and reading, I decided I wanted to be better. I worked in that department as a technician. At that point, teaching and sharing without a certification. It was not required. And so in 2004, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had to go out and have surgery. I had already sent my paperwork in to take my certification test. I called Isham and I delayed it. And then my surgery was in September. I started treatment in November. I was being treated with radiation in December. But that February, because if you didn't take it after a certain amount of time, they forfeited your money. So they were like, you get ready to forfeit your money. I was like, I'm going to take the test. And I went and took the test. You know, I can't for we couldn't afford to forfeit money. I passed the test in 2005. I went to the next commission meeting that anybody saw me was 2006. By that time, I was part of my local group that, like, you're running a group now, the Hampton Road Star Processing Association. I was their secretary treasurer. I became the vice president. Then I became the president for many years because nobody wanted to do the work. But I wanted people to be educated. I became an uh, instructor through Isham. I started teaching the course at the hospitals where I worked because I advocated for certification. I believe that people needed to have the basic minimum knowledge, and you will hear me say it, to kill people. That's just how I put it. Sharon, so I'm just going to put a little pin in that in there because you just downloaded, like, you guys, listen, you've got to start this podcast because Sharon is giving you more than nuggets. She's giving you huge rock size gold here. And it's not just because that's her name, but let's just take a second to digest all of that information that Sharon shared with us. Like one, she started out in the industry with a plan that completely changed by the time she or sterile processing discovered her, which was huge. And it aligns with so many of our stories into the space, right? And secondly, she didn't get certified right away when she started her sterile processing journey. At the time, it wasn't required. Um, it wasn't pushed. And she actually speaks to a lot of the hand over hand training learning on the job. So 
really listen to the fact that Sharon did not receive her certification until 2005, years after her pursuit into the profession. And that's a big takeaway in this story because a lot of us start our careers or our professional stories in sterile processing without certification. I personally live in a state that requires it. As you've heard from the first episode, I failed multiple times and Sharon even had to take hers under so much personal stressors going on all around her. But she paused and she took the time to get her certification. And then Sharon, it sounds like we put a pin in right where you were starting to talk about where that certification took you. You said you started to find colleagues. You started to network at the ISHAM, which is now the HSPA, different chapter meetings, the big conferences that they were having locally. And then you said you were even a teacher. Can I ask you what your preferred study style is and how do you prefer to teach people as a teacher in sterile processing? My study style is to, number one, read the book. Number two, I believe in note-taking. I am a student who's able to to self-motivate to read myself. So if I'm reading myself, I can read, take notes, Pass the test. I became an approved instructor for ISHAM because I wanted to motivate others to get certified. And what I understood before all of these books came out for adult learning is that everybody learns differently. So I teach where you are. I reach you where you are. Some people can read and go with it. Some people you got to stand there and explain every chapter almost line by line, because they don't get it. They don't understand. So I teach to the what I call the light bulb. When I see your eyes light up, I know you finally understand the concept, and we can go to the next concept. So my approved courses were not just 17 weeks. They weren't just three months. They were until you were able to understand, because you already these people were already working in sterile processing. We already let them put trays together and throw them in all the clays. So we had already, at the hospital, decided we accepted what they did. So the fact that it took them sometimes a little longer to learn was okay with me. If we had to stay on Chapter 7 for three weeks, we stayed three weeks until everybody understood what they had to know. Everybody can't take a test, and we were teaching not just for the test, but for comprehension to come back and do a good job. I've always been patient-oriented. So I've always been for the patient, and I've been the patient. As you've heard, I live with lupus. I've been the patient. I've had many surgeries. I want everybody to have the good outcomes I have. So I was interested in then Isham, what they were putting out into the atmosphere, because people just weren't certified. People weren't trying to get certified, didn't nobody care, the hospital didn't care. The hospital is not that they didn't care, they were concerned about how much they have to pay you if you get certified. That's so true, that's that was a good their point. motivation I push. You know, and I really like how you teach towards the light bulb. Sharon, we need to put that on a shirt. I feel like we just need a whole merchandise section of uh, Sharon Green Golden (laughs) sayings. So I love that you teach towards the light bulb. You know, I I teach at a community college and they're so curriculum orientated where it's like, you have to do this, you have to do that. And, you know, as the subject matter expert in the space, they really do give me a lot of leniency with what is important and how I want to deliver it. But teaching to the light bulb is just something that you see on the job too. It's like that moment that somebody realizes that the Bowie Dick challenge, process challenge device has to go in the over the drain, not just in the center of the rack and they realize the drain is at the front of the rack. That's that light bulb moment. And I love how you started to discuss how the certification has served you professionally and why you want to help other professionals achieve that. And we're going to revisit that right when we come back from this break. It's time for our mid-episode confidence boost, where we focus on a key sterile processing test concept. 
Now, there's no guarantee that these concepts will be on the test that you take, but they are key concepts to the workplace and discussed in the literature. Today, we'll cover Bowie Dick testing. Now, Bowie Dick testing is technically a chemical indicator. A lot of the times when we learn about the different types of indicator, we want to put this in as mechanical testing because of what it tests for. Yes, a Bowie Dick does test the mechanical functions of a sterilizer, but it is a chemical indicator because of the way in which it relays the information to us. Remember, your mechanical printouts are usually the printouts that come out of your sterilizer. So a Bowie Dick test is a chemical indicator used to test the sterilizer's ability to remove air from the chamber during air pulls of a pre-vacuum sterilizer, i.e. dynamic air removal cycles. Remember we talked about dynamic air removal and we're doing the big purges. We have to make sure that as we're aggressively removing that air, the sterilizers or the autoclaves can actually maintain that pressure and that air is not leaking back into the sterilizer or out of the sterilizer, which is why we affectionately gave this test the nickname, the leak test. Now, this is done daily after major repairs and is part of your validation verification process in your facility. So just make sure that you're acquainted with your healthcare's policies on how often Bowie Dicks are being done but you will learn that Bowie Dicks are performed after major repairs when the steam has been shut off and daily. If you're a 24-hour facility, it's usually done at 12.01 a.m. If you're not, it's usually done before you run any other sterilizer load for the day. That's right, folks. Bowie Dick tests are run on empty cycles. Now, these little challenge packs sit on the bottom row of your autoclave rack over the drain. Now, if you ask any professional, sometimes they might say the front of your autoclave. That's because that's where the drains are on their sterilizers. So understand the type of sterilizer that you have before you just start placing the Bowie Dick in the front. You may have one that has a drain in the center. The reason why you put the Bowie Dick test over the drain is because you're trying to demonstrate that air is not seeping in or getting into the sterilizer after these purges. So you wanna put it in the most challenging spot. And where would be the best place for air to come in and out? The drain, literally right in the autoclave. So you wanna make sure you place your Bowie Dick test in the most challenging spot, i.e. over the drain, which is dependent on the model of your autoclave. So remember, this is only used on your dynamic air removal cycles and some SFPP, steam flush pressure pulse cycles. Now you'll find this out in your SFPP's IFUs. So make sure that if you're using that type of steam sterilizer, you're checking the IFU to see if it needs this type of testing with it. That's gonna wrap this week's mid-episode confidence boost. And don't forget to pass that test with confidence. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Confidence Certification. If you are just joining us, please stop and start the episode all over again because you missed a huge first half before our break. We have the amazing Sharon Green Golden joining us today, and she is talking about why certification is important. And it's more than just having a bunch of different letters after your name, because really that's all they are, letters after your name, until you start to attach the intentionality and the purpose of what they stand for to your professional career and how you affect and play out patient safety. So before we took a break, Sharon was starting to discuss how certification serves her professionally and how it could serve you professionally. So Sharon, go ahead. Tell us a little bit more about how being certified served you professionally and how you think it will help others. Well, after I became certified, of course, with this program, you have to have 12 CEs a year, which means you have to continue to learn. I was teaching and teaching people not 
to take a CE for the test. Now, you know, there's two ways to take a CE. One is to learn and comprehend, and one is to get a CE. So a lot of people just get a CE. They don't even know what they read. But certification, I did for me in the beginning. This was for me to say, Sharon Green Golden is now a certified technician, meaning I want you to understand I do know what I'm doing. You know, I could go stand and say, hey, wait a minute. No, no, don't do that. And they didn't have to say, well, why you say that? And I didn't have to say somebody told me because I don't believe in somebody's. You know, I have to teach away from somebody because somebody tell bad information all the time. So I got the <laughs> certification and I stood on it. I stood on it. I was proud of it. I was proud to be who I was. And I went to the issue meetings and I wanted to be involved. The words are, be the change you want to see. Don't sit back and be on, you heard me say it, don't be on the complaint team. Be on the change team. So the only way I could be on the change team was to motivate and stimulate people to certification. I don't care if they don't give you but 10 cents. Take the 10 cents. Be proud of who you are and what you're doing. Understand that what we do matters and we take care of patients every day. And the patients don't even get the opportunity to tell us, thank you for bad work. Be certified (laughs) to be proud of who you are and work your way up. So I actually got involved, as I told you, my local chapter, went as a representative to the issue at that time. I went from being the parliamentarian at the national meetings to running for secretary treasurer, which I was secretary treasurer for two terms. I was on the board twice. My trajectory within the association was to be the change I wanted to see. And that was a trajectory that was going up towards presidency. I watched President Richard Shule motivate and stimulate us to better for several years. And I wanted to emulate who he was in the profession. I've always admired his tenacity to get things done within the issue. And so one of the things we always wanted to do, of course, which we haven't been able to completely get done in the United States of America due to political stances, is statewide required mandatory certification. So I got on the team here in the Commonwealth of Virginia to say, well, if we can't get it in the state, and the reason we couldn't is because enough people have not nationally died from anything we've done. Because I went to a meeting and on the state meeting, the young the lady said on the state board, you don't have to certify sterile processing. They don't harm nobody. Ah, uh, my heart. You know, that, that hurt my know heart what right about now. What we did. Ugh. Yes. The heart of yes, the hospital. They don't harm nobody. <laughs> yes, we do. Listen. And so what I did was work to motivate my C-suite and HR to, to say, you can't work at our hospital if you're not certified. And a lot of hospitals have gone to that plan. You cannot work at the hospital if you're not certified. If you're already at the hospital, we call it grandfathering. We will grandfather you if you're going to retire at a certain point. But if you're not retiring at a certain point, we gave you uh, six months to two years to get your certification. Because see, what I do know with adult learners is that if you push me to take a national test and I'm not I'm not a test-wise person, I will usually fail. And you, I've heard you say that you took it many times. I had a young lady that I taught, she took it five times. Every time she didn't make it, she comes to me, we cry, and I say, get the book, let's start over again. Because you're going to pass this test. She did. She finally got her certification. But it's I think it's something that it should be required. They should want to know that we know what we're doing. So as we put a pin in that right there, I need you all to let what Sharon just said resonate with you. You need to be the professional you want to be. And being confident for your sterile processing certification tests and achieving certification will help you become the professional you want to be in the sterile processing space. 
and not just for yourself, but as Sharon's elaborating for the patient. And don't get me wrong, patient safety is the number one motivator and should be the main reason why we do what we do. But we have to be a part of that story because that's what's going to push us across the finish line for certification. So when we speak to crossing that finish line, getting certified, like the young lady that Sharon spoke about in her story, my own professional development story, and then even being adult learners who now have to get certified, whether it's required by the facility or the state that you're in. I want to ask Sharon why all of this is even worth it. You know, if we are putting ourselves through all of that, we already know that certification will help the professional, right, in in retrospect and help them demonstrate their subject matter expertise. What would you say to the professional when they ask you, Sharon, why am I going to do any of this? You're going to do this because it matters, number one, to you. Number two, it matters to the peers that you work with every day. Number three, it matters to the patients that you take care of. Just like you want your doctor to have a license. You know, we get excited when we find out we want a doctor and he has no license. You want your dentist to be credentialed. You want your nurse to be licensed. We should have credentialing, saying that we have done something extra to prove that we know that we know that we know. See, when I stand up in my department and I go to work, I don't know everything, but I know enough to say that in the field of sterilization processes, I have the t-shirt, the hat, and a bag of chips. Been there, done that. This is who I am. I am a sterile processing professional and proud of it. And I want everyone on my bus to have the same feeling and the same credentials. Because you see, when the patients come to this hospital that I'm at, I want them, even though they don't see us, to feel confident that anything being used on them in a surgical procedure has met the standards, has met the standards. And why do we know it met the standards? Because the people down in the basement, around the corner in the secret room, we know what we're doing. We are experts in our profession. So, Sarah, I say nobody can come and just jump into sterile processing. You, you know that very well. I have a, and I'll, I'll give you this. I have gone to the C-suite and said, if we had a big major catastrophe tomorrow and we had to keep the surgical department going because people are being hurt, You could take a sterile processing technician and put them in the kitchen and we could take and tell us, put one scoop of soup in the bowl and two crackers. We can do that. You could take a sterile processing technician and say, we need you in EBS, environmental services, take the trash, tie it up, put the red bag in that can and the white bag in that can. We could do that. You could take the sterile processing technician that has experience, that's been doing this, that knows their instrument. And if you didn't have OR techs, you could take that sterile processing technician, put them in a gown, put them in some gloves, tell them to keep their hands off of their face and above their waist and pass me the Delphi. And we could do that. You cannot take anybody else to the SPD and say, SPD has the blue today. Let's rock. There's nobody in this hospital that could go into that department and work those trades. Number one, they don't know the IFUs for cleaning. So you don't have a clean trade. It's not about building trades. You know, my OR says, I can come help you put a trade together. Baby, before the tray gets put together, it has to be cleaned. After it's cleaned, it has to be checked for workability. After you do all of that, we have to process it. Is this steam? Is this low temperature? Is this just high level disinfected? Is this just cleaned? They don't know. So when we don't show, as you said, the heart of the hospital, we got to shut the hospital down, but 
got to shut it down. So why do we want professionals? And why are we professional? Because nobody can do what we do. So remember, everybody, as we start to wrap the show, you are not defined by your certification, but you must get the certification to demonstrate that you are the professional, the subject matter expert to the patient that they deserve and that they need you to be. And before you guys all go and get, oh my God, that was so wonderful and awestruck. I did not make that up. You guys know that was Sharon Green Golden. Okay, I was just paraphrasing that, all right? So as we transition into the end of this episode, I want to ask Sharon really quick. Now, usually, Sharon, we assign homework at the end of our shows because, you know, you got to reinforce the study of everything we've heard today. So if you could provide one way that people could move on after being discouraged, what's that one quick advice that you would give someone to regain their focus? I think the one thing is that you must never give up on yourself. Understand. I have letters behind my name and now it means something. I've worked 30 years in this profession to be who I am. I have worked 30 years on becoming Ms. SPD professional. It has become my passion. I believe in what I do. So what I want to share with people is don't give up on yourself. You didn't pass the test the first time. This time really go study. I had a young lady that didn't pass. And she said, and I said, well, what do you think it was? And she said, well, I'm, I'm going to go read. I said, read the whole book. I said, how many, how much of the book did you read? She said, chapter 12, up to 12. I said, the book got 22 chapters. Read the whole book. Get an understanding. So for people who are discouraged, don't be discouraged. That's life. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off. And if this is what you like to do, move forward. Understand, this has got to be your passion. You've got to say, hey, I'm going to be doing this for 30 years. I need to like it. I got to go every day. And then involve yourself in becoming special in something that you do in that field. Sarah, you have become an outspoken advocate. You were, I'm sure you weren't always outspoken in this field, but you've made this be your passion. Everyone needs to Find something that they like. And when you like it and it's your passion, my words are everyone reach one. Turn around and find that potential in somebody else you're working with. And even though they're discouraged and downtrodden, bring them on. Pull them. Pull them. Pull them. Pull them to their greatness. Because you see, quietly somebody motivated me at the meetings I went to to be the person I am today. And I am great for that pull. And so I pull other people. They come kicking and screaming. But if you're going to be in this field, and you're going to take care of my patients. I need you not to just have left behind you. And that's the thing. I need you to be the letters behind your name. Be the change you want to see. Be that professional. Oh my That's gosh. Me. And if there wasn't a better way to, uh, if there wasn't a better way to wrap this show, everybody, Sharon Green Golden. Sharon, thank you so much for joining us today and especially ending with such an inspirational message. And I can promise that I will confidently take my certification test and be the professional that you and our patient need to be. I'll make that promise right now. Everybody, that's your homework. Make sure you go and make that promise right now. All right, Sharon, thank you again for your time. Thanks, darling. And that's going to do it for this week's episode. For more sterile processing education and resources, make sure to visit beyondclean.net or follow Beyond Clean on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to check out over a thousand SPD related videos at youtube.com slash beyond clean. If you have any questions or comments for the show, you can reach out to info at beyondclean.net. 
Finally, make sure to download the Beyond Clean mobile app on the Apple and Android app stores so that you don't miss a future episode of any of the other awesome Beyond Clean podcasts. My name is Sarah B. Cruz, and you've been listening to Confidence Certification. Until next time, keep fighting dirty and pass that test with confidence. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast series are of Sarah B. Cruz only and do not represent the companies she works for or collaborates with. Oh, 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 o